Welcome to Hascom Central. I'm Barry Lerner. And I'm Catherine Townsend. We're your Hascom reporters. With today's Hascom report number three, which we call Controlling Hazards, Labels MSDS Training. First, why all the sudden concern about hazardous chemicals? It's because the Occupational Safety and Health Administration has issued a document called the Hazard Communication Standard. This new HAZCOM standard requires that manufacturers and importers, as well as users of hazardous chemicals, take certain steps to ensure... Barry, let safety. me interrupt. There's been an accident at the McKelfrey plant. Uh, Penny Condoni is on the site with the story, and we're going to her now. Penny? Catherine, can you hear me? Yes, Penny, go ahead. What's happening? Well, it's an emergency situation here at McKelfrey Manufacturing Plant on Victor Road. There's been a sizable spill of a hazardous substance, and the area has been blocked off. There's even talk of evacuating the area. Hold it. Chief, Chief, uh, this is for the HAZCOM report. Can you tell us what's going on? Yeah, we got a bad spill here of a set of nitro, and we're trying to uh, contain it right now. Uh, just one more question. Is there any danger to the surrounding area? Not if the wind doesn't shift and it doesn't catch fire. But what if it does? Doesn't what? Catch fire. What if it does catch fire? Well, it can cause a poisonous gas in the area, and we're trying to stop that. Would that call for an evacuation? Well, it sure could for maybe a radius of a half a mile or more, and we're trying to prevent that too. But I got to go. Thank you, Chief. Penny, do you know what caused this, Bill? Is anybody hurt? Well, that's only rumor at this. Wait, uh, this is the safety superintendent, sir. This is for the HAZCOM report. Can you tell us what's going on? Yes, it was a mistake on the part of an employee. He didn't realize the tank contained acetonitro, and I'm afraid he didn't know anything about the substance. Was he hurt? Uh, yes, only minor chemical burns, as far as I could tell. They took him to medical. You'll have to excuse me now. Thank you, sir. Well, that's the story at this point. I'll stand by to report progress in containing the spill and preventing further problems. But that's it for now. Back to you, Catherine. We'll keep in touch with that situation as we continue with this now timely HAZCOM report on controlling hazards. It's situations like this, the emergency going on right now at the McKelfrey plant, that OSHA had in mind when it formulated the Hazard Communication Standard. Let's get back to it now, Catherine. All right, Barry. The HAZCOM Standard is a five-step program which strives to assure the informing and training of employees of companies in 20 basic industries about any and all hazardous materials they may be working with or around. The five steps are capsulized here. Steps to determine the hazard, to commit the program to writing, to label containers, to maintain material safety data sheets, and to inform and train employees to work safely around hazardous chemicals. In this report, we are going to concentrate on the last three steps of the standard. Step three of the five steps is labels and other warnings. Judd Lindsay has compiled this video report. A label by HASCOM standards can be anything that communicates the required information. A tag, a printed label, all will suffice if they're in English, if they're legible, and if they're prominently displayed in the work area involved. Hazardous chemicals entering or leaving a work area must give three items of information. The identity of the hazardous chemicals in scientific or common terminology, hazard warning to ensure employee understanding and protection, and the name and address of the manufacturer or importer of the substance. The company can use signs or process sheets or batch tickets or anything else that communicates. Portable containers of hazardous chemicals do not have to have labels if a single person handles it, uses it immediately, and only within the work shift during which it was filled. Labels on incoming containers must not be defaced or destroyed or else they must be immediately replaced. If existing labels, such as well-known Department of Transportation labels, do the job, they don't have to be replaced. Normally, pipelines carrying hazardous chemicals within the plant do not have to be labeled. Labels are normally affixed by the manufacturer or importer or distributor. They don't give full information, but they certainly alert you to danger. And that's the report on the labeling requirements, Catherine. Good, Judd. I wonder why they don't adopt a standard label. Well, the way I understand it, Catherine, many labels currently meet the HAZCOM standard, and it would be pointless to change these labels. In fact, a change would do more harm than good. Now we come to step four in the five-step requirement of the HAZCOM standard, material safety data sheets. 
These MSDS contain a variety of essential information about specific hazardous substances. And there's got to be an MSDS for each and every chemical or chemical mixture. Bill Worsham has a report on this vital element of the HAZCOM standard. Bill? I'm here with Ben Hardesty, an industrial hygienist, who's going to help us understand what MSDS are all about. Ben, who's responsible for originating MSDS? Manufacturers and importers of hazardous chemicals are responsible for forwarding these material safety data sheets on each hazardous chemical that they ship at the time of shipment. But the end user also has a responsibility to obtain the MSDS on any hazardous chemical coming into the plant. What kind of information must be on the MSDS, Ben? Well, there's a lot, Bill. Nine separate sections of information on a detailed form and no blank spaces are permitted. Now I have a blow-up here of a typical MSDS, front and back, on a fictional product called Zapathon. Now you can see the name of the product in the upper right-hand corner of the face of the sheet. Now the name is made up, but the properties are very typical. Can we take this section by section? Sure, if you like. In section one, that's for the chemical name and the manufacturer, as you see. And you list the name and address of the manufacturer here. And then, over here, there's an emergency phone number if there's any problem. Also in section one, you list the trade name of the product, which is a corrosion inhibitor, and just below, the chemical family it belongs to. In this case, phenolic resin. Now, this is also a blend of materials, and you say so here. That is section one. Section two is called hazardous ingredients, uh, meaning of the mixture or blend? Right. And in this section, you note the components, and then any new information that's been uncovered pertaining to the threshold limit value, for example, or any new tests or experiments that have been conducted on any of the components. They seem to be talking about some experiments with rats in this particular MSDS. Well, that's the sort of information that the MSDS is designed to communicate. Mr. Hardesty, this is Barry Lerner. In Section 2, you have Stoddard Solvent listed and then some numbers. What does that mean? Barry, Stoddard Solvent is one component of this particular product. The number 12 in the percentage column means that Stoddard Solvent makes up approximately 12% of the product. The number in the TLV column, 100, stands for 100 parts per million, which is the safe exposure limit for an average person day in and day out. Now, in Section 3... On physical data? Yes. In this section, you deal with the typical physical data pertaining to the product. Its appearance, a clear liquid, its odor typical of a hydrocarbon solvent, boiling point, specific gravity, and other pertinent data that identify some basic uh, properties of the compound. You need to know the properties of these chemicals so that you can handle and store them safely and to be able to deal with any emergency involving it, such as fire or explosion. Speaking of fire, what's the meaning of the term flashpoint in Section 4? Flashpoint tells you the temperature at which a substance releases enough vapors to ignite and burn. The flashpoint is the danger point, so to speak. Our fictitious substance, Zapathon, you see, has a flashpoint of 115 degrees Fahrenheit. So when you read that on the MSDS, you know that when the temperature of Zapathon gets up around 115 degrees, you have a real fire hazard on your hands. Chemicals with a low flash point are, of course, the most flammable. Section 4 looks crucial. Uh, fire and explosion hazard data, it says. Yes. In this section, you note the flash point of the substance, as well as how to go about extinguishing the fire if it ignites or it explodes. Section 5 is on the back of the page. Now, in Section 4, we talked about physical data. Section 5 talks about health hazard data. We've covered the difference in previous reports. Well, then you already know that when we speak of health hazards, we're talking about dangers to your health posed by exposure to the chemical. In Section 5 here, you'll note the TLV, 100 parts per million for the hazardous ingredient in the compound in this case. TLV. That's the average amount you can be exposed to without harm, isn't it? Right. You note both the acute or immediate effects of overexposure and the chronic effects which occur over a longer period. 
This section also specifies emergency and first aid procedures. Section 6 talks about reactivity data. What kind of reactivity are we talking about? Chemical reactivity. In this section, you note the stability or instability and the chemicals that are incompatible with the product. In Section 6, Mr. Hardesty, when it notes that a chemical is unstable or reactive, exactly what does that mean? A chemical is said to be unstable if it has a tendency to react with other chemicals or to decompose during normal handling or storage. These reactions can have undesirable after effects, such as pressure buildup or a rise in temperature or even a release of toxic vapor or gas. So if the MSDS says that a chemical is unstable, you probably need to take special precautions with it. Section 7 looks to be a key element of the MSDS because it tells us what to do in case of a leak or spill of a hazardous chemical. Yes, the spill or leak procedures section deals in specifics too, you'll notice, and it covers proper waste disposal procedures for the chemical as well. And Section 8... On special protection information? Yes. Here you list the respiratory protection you need when handling the chemical, the ventilation required, the kind of gloves that you need, eye protection, that sort of thing. And finally, there's Section 9 on special precautions? Correct. Now these apply when you are handling or storing the product. And finally, the MSDS is dated and signed by the person who reviewed the sheet. Well, it seems to say an awful lot in a small space. Yes, its purpose is to put all crucial information about the product at anyone's fingertips immediately. Because in an emergency, there's no time to hunt around for what you need to know. Mr. Hardesty, are MSDS for use only in emergencies? Well, sometimes I think that is the only time people do look at them. But they really should study these sheets before they begin to handle the chemical so that they know what they're dealing with and they can be that much more careful. Thank you, Ben Hardesty. And that's our coverage of the MSDS element in the new HASCOM standard. Let's add this. MSDS must be constantly updated and available to OSHA and to employees and their representatives. And they must be readily at hand in every work area. Before we move on to the next step, Catherine, we have an update on the McKelfrey situation, and we're going now to Penny Condoni on the scene. I'm in the medical department of the McKelfrey plant, where a spill of acetonitrile has firefighters mobilized to contain the hazardous chemical and prevent fire and resulting evacuation. The man injured in the mishap is Jeff Raintree, and he's here with me now. Jeff, what exactly happened? Oh, it was just a stupid mistake, really. I just wasn't thinking. You see, I saw this gunk come spewing out all over the place. And, well, someone started the pump without closing the bleeder valve. And uh, it was just going everywhere. And I was right there, so I tried to do something about it. The gunk, as you call it, was it acetonitrile? Yes, ma'am, acetonitrile, which is pretty bad stuff. But they told us all about it, so it's, it's my own darn fault. I guess I just wasn't thinking. I saw the spill, and I rushed in to turn it off. Were you hurt badly? Oh, no, not too badly. Uh, they uh, just burned the skin on my hand and arm a little bit, but they flushed it for about 15 minutes and say it's going to be okay. All right. Uh, let me ask you, Jeff. Did you realize it was acetonitrile when you rushed in? No, not really. Well, I knew it, but I just wasn't thinking. I guess I acted on instinct. My instincts don't know much about chemicals. Thank you, Jeff Raintree. Uh, Catherine, my latest information is that they are still working to contain this bill, but there's no assurance that a, an evacuation won't be called for. I'll stay on top of the story to report further developments. And now back to Hascom Central. Very good, Penny. There's a rather obvious point here. Jeff Raintree, the injured man, just told us that despite his basic knowledge about the hazard, he just didn't think, and that caused the injury. It leads to the speculation that the new HASCOM standard we're covering now will help only if the knowledge it provides is put to use. Now to the final step in the HASCOM standard is employee information and training. We sent a HASCOM crew to an industrial training session in progress, and we'll show you some of that now. And the main point in this new hazard communication system that OSHA has put out is to inform you and train you so that you'll know exactly what kind of hazard you're dealing with and how to handle it safely. Yes? Do we get to see this standard ourselves? 
Oh, yes, absolutely. It's required, as a matter of fact. You'll find copies of it posted and available all over. Believe me, you won't be able to miss it if you try. Uh, but for the moment, here's a rundown of what we're doing about informing you. But how will we know what chemicals we are around? We'll tell you. Uh, any hazardous chemicals in any work area on this site, you'll know where to find a, a complete list of them. And also the MSDS, that's the Material Safety Data Sheets, that tell you what you need to know about any hazardous material. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. I've seen these MSDS things. They look a little complicated. How are we supposed to understand all that technical stuff? Okay, well, that's going to be part of your training. We are going to train you to recognize the signs and symptoms of excessive exposure, what to look for, what odors to recognize, just generally how to tell when there may be danger. And that's our segment on the employee information and training step in the new HAZCOM procedure. And now we have some good news from the McCaffrey plant. Penny Condoni is with the safety supervisor there now. The danger of fire and evacuation at McCaffrey Manufacturing Plant here is past. The spill of acetonitrile has been cleaned up and workers are going back to their jobs. I am here with the plant safety superintendent. Sir, is it appropriate to sound the all clear? Yes, the fire department did a terrific job and it's back to work. Are there plans to prevent any further accidents like this? Well, we're reviewing our equipment and training, and we're going to beef up our training programs, and I hope the OSHA standard helps. You sound dubious. Dubious? No, I think we can improve our chances of this never happening again, but... Uh, but what? Well, I don't want to put too much blame on the young man who got hurt, but uh, the tank was labeled, and data on the contents were available to him not 20 yards from where it happened. I mean... If people don't get serious and use the information and training, well, I just don't see it doing any good. Some way, we've got to get everybody involved. Uh, we'll just keep on trying. Thank you. Well, the emergency is over and normalcy is restored. The damage was negligible, and the injury to one man, Jeff Raintree, was minor. On that happy note, it's back to Hascon Central. Thanks, Penny. That's going to wind up our coverage of the HAZCOM standard for this edition. We reported to you on controlling the hazards through labels, MSDS, and training. Three of the five steps required of companies in 20 different industries by the new OSHA hazard communication standard. We investigated labels and what they must contain to warn everyone of hazards within. We went through a typical MSDS section by section to see what it contained and we sat in on a training class to discover what the required employee information and training encompasses. In future editions of the HASCOM Report, we'll cover other phases of the new OSHA standard. But for now, I'm Barry Lerner. And I'm Katherine Townsend. We're your HASCOM Reporters, and this has been the third of our series of HASCOM Reports. Thank you for watching.